Welcome to Evil Done Badly, the worst podcast in the history of the world. I am your host, Dick, and I'm glad to have you along for this special Halloween episode featuring the old-timey serial killer, Peter Curtin. This nutcase, he's from Germany, and he went on a sadistic rampage between the years 1913 and 1929. He had a couple of nicknames, so you know he was completely bonkers. So let's get in there and pull back Peter's curtain and find out why he was dubbed the Vampire of Dusseldorf. But first, grab yourself a spooky beverage, hold on to your shapely arse, and let's hear the theme song. <laughs> This special Halloween episode of Evil Done Badly is brought to you by the wide world of paranormal investigations and ridiculous thrifter groups on Facebook. They're oozing with popularity and are growing every week. The wide world of paranormal investigations group just passed 16,000 members. And ridiculous thrifter, well, they're right there behind them. Both are totally worth checking out. Now let's get back to the show. Peter Curtin was born in 1883 and was the oldest of 13 children. He lived in a one-bedroom shithole in Cologne, Germany. And his father was a drunken prick and beat the crap out of all of them. The dad would make them watch as he sexually assaulted their mother and would eventually be convicted of incest. The incest was not with his wife, it was with his daughters. In case you were wondering, I believe the sexual abuse was limited to the girls in the family, so Peter's butthole was probably the one part of him that was uh, safe. Uh, needless to say, it was all very wholesome. At nine, Peter here, he... uh. He pushed a friend of his off a raft. And, um, it wasn't accidental because he's a little piece of shit. Uh, while his poor friend was flopping around trying to breathe, uh, another friend, who wasn't a piece of shit, jumped in to save his life. And then Peter held them both under the water so they suffocated. He would go on to claim that it was all an accident, and he was never suspected of any wrongdoing. So he's already got away with two murders, and he's not even ten yet. What a little cunt. And uh, when he was 13, he decided to satisfy his teenage horniness by making sweet, sweet love to the animals at local farms. It's here he discovered that uh, bestiality was a whole lot more fun if you stab the animals just as you're about to get off. He got caught doing this. He got caught slashing a pig while he had his dick in there. And, well, since he got caught, he claims to have stopped with all that. So, uh, he left the burn and he went back home and attempted to rape his sister. Uh, this is one of the sisters that his dad had already had his way with. And this just keeps getting grosser. And grosser. Happy Halloween, everybody. Curtin claims that his first attempted murder was of an 18-year-old girl in 1899. He put the moves on her, and he suckered her into uh, having sex with him in the garden. During the coitus, uh, he strangled her unconscious and decided that having sex and murdering people at the same time was the absolute heights of erotic ecstasy. So the seed was planted for him, and, well, he was a little lost murderer in the, uh, in the making. Now, there are no actual records of this attack, so it's kind of assumed that this poor girl eventually came to and probably did not succumb to her injuries. Peter didn't know that, and as far as he was concerned, she was dead, and he had had a great time killing her. 
and, uh, well, he's a little cunt, and he would rack up quite the rap sheet over the next few years. He would be charged with fraud, attempted murder, a whole fucking bunch of arsons, and deserting the army. I can't really blame him on that last one. If you maybe join the army, I'd skedaddle my dainty little pasty white ass out of there first chance I get. I'm not going to lie, I am not getting down and giving anyone 50. He claimed to be having violent fantasies. No big surprise there. And he claimed to fantasize about killing as many people as possible. Even to the point of jizzing his pants over it. Because he's a little sicko. To make matters worse, by 1913 German standards, Mr. Curtin was considered adorable. I've seen pictures and, well, I don't get it. He's a dorky little alfalfa Hitler looking fucker. And despite this, he had no trouble attracting women. His cold, violent demeanor made it hard to hold on to them. But he had no trouble attracting them in the first place. So he spends the better part of his life, about 24 years or so, in and out of jail, and was flat broke and getting more bitter all the time. You know, if you stop going to prison and getting this shit knocked out of you in prison, you might not be quite so bitter, you asshole. So he came out of prison even angrier and more depraved than ever. So, in May of 1913, Curtin is in the process of burgling at a tavern, and he runs across a nine-year-old Christine Klein sleeping unattended in her bed. What do you do when you find this? Well, if you're Curtin, you hop on top of her, strangle her, and slash her throat. And uh, as the poor girl's blood was drizzling out of her onto the floor, he got all excited and blew his load. To make matters worse, he comes back the next day, not to the same tavern, but to a tavern across the road, so he could sit around and experience the disgusted ambiance and all the gossip that was going around about the sick fuck that ended the little girl's life. Obviously, he got off on the repulsion and was thoroughly enjoying himself. And he also got off with the whole thing. He was never a suspect in this grisly child murder. However that works. Two months later, Curtin is still flat broke and conveniently happened across another sleeping girl in the process of burgling. 17-year-old Gertrude Franken. Here we go again. He hops on top of her, strangles her, and soils his drawers. He gets away unscathed from this incident, and fortunately, Gertrude would recover from her injuries. This guy, this guy really needs a hot-pointed stick up the ass. So he didn't get mad for either of these attacks, but he did do eight years in a military prison for a bunch of regular, non-murderous burglaries and arsons. So, while he's in prison, he's unable to satiate his girl-murdering desires until he's released in April of 1921. Curtin moves out of prison, moves in with his sister, and gets married to a former prostitute who had previously been convicted of shooting her fiancé to death. Unfortunately, she would not pull this stunt again with Curtin, and Curtin went on living. You know, he's just going on about his normal day, living with this murderer, and for some reason she couldn't bring herself to kill Peter. That's a tragedy. They moved back to Dusseldorf, and he began two affairs with domestic servants. I told you, this guy was adorable. He's an ugly, adorable fuckface. 
and his four-sided little love triangle falls apart when the wife figures out that she's in one and one of the servants claims that he raped her. The rape charge is dropped, but he winds up with an eight-month sentence for seduction. What the fuck? You can go to jail for being seductive? I had no idea. Probably explains why I've never been in jail. I'm not sexy enough. I'm, I'm kind of insulted. Moving on. In February of 1929, Curtin kicks it into high gear. He trails a woman named Apollonia Kuhn and drags her behind a bush and stabs her 24 times with a pair of scissors. Somehow, she would survive the attack. That is incredible, but many more would not be so lucky. Five days later, he strangled nine-year-old Rosa Oliger and used a pair of scissors to stab her pretty much all over her body. He went in his pants and proceeded to rub his semen all over the inside of her mangled genitals. He dragged her under a hedge, covered her in kerosene, and set her on fire, and went about jizzing in his pants again. All right, okay. The pant jizzing's getting kind of old, and I'm going to stop saying that now. Just assume from here on in that any time this guy does anything evil, he's ejaculating all over the place. So I'll try not to bring it up anymore. And five days after that, he throws a real curveball and stabs 45-year-old mechanic Rudolph Shear 20 times. Shear dies, and uh, Peter comes back to the scene afterwards to schmooze with the police and just to try and throw them off the scent. And according to the police, these three murders are considered linked because of their grisly nature. Which makes sense. The crack team of criminologists on the case, they dubbed the perpetrator abnormal. Yep. How about that? Abnormal. That's that's incredibly insightful. Boy, these criminologists, they earned their paychecks that day, let me tell you. Curtin then goes into a bit of a slump. He claims to have strangled four more women over the next few months, but there are no confirmed murders connected with him from this time. In August of that year, he meets Maria Kuhn and put on the charm and took her out on a date. He lured her into a meadow and took turns strangling and stabbing her, eventually sitting on her and waiting for her to pass on. He buried the body with the intention of coming back and nailing her to a tree simply for the shock value. But when he dug her up, he found her too heavy to prop up on the tree, so he put her back in the hole. Three months later, he drew a map and sent it to the police. The police took it seriously enough to follow it, and indeed, it did lead to Maria's body. So, there's no doubt about its authenticity. A few days later, he randomly stabbed three very different people, two women and a man, and uh, all three survived. But three days later, foster sisters Louise Linton and Gertrude Hamacher would not be so lucky. They were ages uh, 14 and 5, respectively, and he met them as they were walking home through the allotments. He sent Louise away, which was the older girl, to buy him cigarettes, with the promise of a monetary reward. With the older sister gone, he raised little Gertrude by her neck, choked her unconscious, slashed her throat, and discarded the body in a bean field. When Louise returned, she was strangled, stabbed, had her throat cut, and Curtin attempted to drink her blood through her wounds. As you can see, well, where the vampire stuff comes from. He kept the carnage coming and attempted 
four more stabbings and one more strangling, none of which turned out fatal. And none of this yield any sensible clues that could lead to his capture. So he's still home free. But what do you do when you've got zero for five on your last five murder attempts? Well, you switch up the game plan. He retires his knife and digs out his trusty hammer. On the evening of September 30th, Curtin encounters 31-year-old Ida Reuter at Dusseldorf Station. Now, he's still adorable, and he convinced her to accompany him to a cafe for a beverage. He kept the sweet talk flowing and persuaded her to go for a nice, secluded walk through the town garden in Munich. At this location, he repeatedly struck her around the head with the hammer, both before and after he had raped her. According to Curtin, the poor girl came to for a bit in the middle of it, and he resumed hammering her to death. This ugly bastard proceeded to pick up another servant girl 11 days later and took her out for beverages. He charmed Elizabeth Dorier into going for a romantic walk along the Klein Dussel River, where he smacked her in the head with the hammer and sexually assaulted her. He then beat her into a coma and left her for dead. She was found the next day still alive, but would succumb the very next day to her injuries. And on October 25th, he attacked two more women with his hammer. They survived the attacks, but Curtin did break his hammer in the middle of the second one, so he was going to have to find something else. So he's now hammerless, and he switches back to the scissors. On November 7th, he finds five-year-old Gertrude Alberman and took her to a secluded allotment, stabbed her in the temple, and strangled her. After she had died, he stabbed her another 34 times before hiding the body in a pile of nettles. Whatever a nettle is, I have no idea. But I guess they're good for hiding dead bodies in, according to this. So at this point, Germany is gone apeshit. And Curtin is very famous as the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Thousands of leads pour in, and it culminates in a mountain of paperwork. Close to 10,000 interviews are conducted, and literally almost a million people were on the suspect list. Quick note. Quick note, I feel like I gotta add this in here. I never use the word literally, because it's easily the most inappropriately overused word in the English language. So, I mean, there was an actual almost million people on this list. That's not an exaggeration. I think that's probably exactly equal to the number of males above the age of 12 in Germany at the time. They were very thorough because they were getting a bit desperate. Curtin himself sent three letters describing the various locations of dead bodies that he had left in his wake. These letters were considered genuine and written by the same guy. So, yeah, they were pretty sure this guy had done all the murders. But who the fuck was he? Curtin would go on committing attacks, 10 in total over the next few months, none of which would prove fatal, but one would finally prove to be his undoing. On May 14, 1930, Maria Bublik was approached by an unknown man at a train station. This man offered to show her the way to a local hostel. She agreed to follow him, and she became a little apprehensive when he tried to take her through a desolate wooded area. I mean, after all, it was no secret that an ugly, crazy madman vampire monster guy was on the loose. This man was offended at her reluctance, and the two began to argue. So, they're arguing, and a hero comes along, and asks Maria if this idiot is bothering her. She says, yes, good sir, save me from this idiot. The idiot backs down 
and leaves her in the care of the hero. And who is this knight in shining armor? Well, his name is Peter Curtin, of course. So Marie is a little rattled, and she accompanies Curtin to his apartment, where he sucks up to her with food and beverages. Curtin is a real gentleman here. He minds his manners by straight up asking her for sex, which she refuses. So he says, no problem, and he offers to walk her to a hotel. She's a little put off by the whole thing. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, she agrees. He leads her through a spooky forest, attempts to strangle and rape her, but lets her go when she starts to scream. That's fucking awesome. We've got a living witness who knows where he lives. Go to the police and get him. Maria does not go to the police, but she does write a letter about the incident to her friend. Yay! So the friend can go to the police. However, this letter gets misdirected. Oh no! This cunt, he's going to get away with it, isn't he? Well, no. Fortunately, a clerk at the post office finds this lost letter and commits a felony crime and reads the letter that is not addressed to them. Noticing the disturbing content of the letter, it gets forwarded to the police and they track down Maria Bublik. She still remembers the address, which, well, Curtin was counting on her not doing, and she leads him to the apartment. Curtin is not home at the time, and he gets wind that they are looking for him and skips town with the help of his wife. He does this by telling her that he's a rapist, and he's looking at some hard time if he gets caught, but he's in no way a murderer. Okay, so she agrees she helps him. And uh, he moves out for a while. But uh, he comes back home a little while later. And to his wife, he goes, You know what? You know what, honey? About this whole vampire thing? Yeah, that was me. I'm totally a murderer. And she's like, What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm the vampire guy. All right. So... With that out in the open, he comes up with this cool idea that she should be the one to turn him in so that she can collect the reward money. She sleeps on it for the night, and the next day she calls the police, and they arrest him at gunpoint. On May 24th of 1930, he admits to 68 crimes, including 9 murders, 31 attempted murders, drinking people's blood, and slicing the head off a swan so he can drink its blood. He said the reason for it all was he was just mad at all the suffering he had endured in his childhood, and uh, he was bitter at being incarcerated all the time, so he took it out on his victims. He admitted to jizzing at the sight of bloody things, but he would not admit to torturing any of his child victims. He freely admitted to killing them, but he didn't torment them in the process. Despite the murders, the blood, the semen, the vampirism, and despite being a complete psycho, Curtin was found to be sane and liable for his actions. After a 10-day trial, the jury deliberated for two whole hours before finding him guilty and sentencing him to have his head lopped off. Yay! He asked for a pardon for the whole head lopping thing, but uh, he was denied. It's good. He asked to see a priest so he could confess to him, and he wanted to be able to write apologies to the families of the victims and to his wife. These requests were granted, and he was allowed two helpings of wiener schnitzel wine and fries. And I guess, well, that makes for a nice big dead guy crap in his pants when he bites the bullet. At 6 a.m. on July 2nd, 1931, he makes his way to the guillotine. 
That's an ungodly hour to be beheaded. That's almost worse than the execution itself. So, he's standing there next to the guillotine, and everybody's all bleary-eyed, and this crowd's there to see him, and it's very early. And he turns to his shrink and says, quote, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment? So, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. Unquote. This guy plans on jizzing his drawers as he's having his noggin sliced off. He plans on being a sick fuck right to the very end. What a cunt. His head, after it was lopped off, was studied. And it was based on state-of-the-art 1931 medical technology that found out, well, his brain was more or less ordinary. But he was the first sexual sadist to have an educational deep dive done into his shenanigans. And if you're so inclined, you can throw the family in the station wagon and head off to Ripley's, believe it or not, in Wisconsin and see Curtin's actual bisected head. Wisconsin, you sure have a weird history. I'm sure we'll be coming back to Wisconsin sometime soon on this podcast. Another note is that I have no idea if his wife ever got the reward for turning this guy in. I sure hope so. She's been through enough. And that's it for Peter Curtin. The Vampire of Dusseldorf. And now for an update. Let's see what else is happening in the world of stabbing people with scissors these days. This update comes from Victor, Idaho. Luna Nicoya Faedra Serrano is a 48-year-old woman accused of kicking her ex-boyfriend off his bed, smacking him around, and stabbing him with scissors on two separate occasions. I gotta say, Luna is actually a pretty cool name. But uh, apart from the cool name, uh, she gets way less cooler the, the more you look into it. On September 17th, she allegedly went to Derek Hawk's house and stabbed him, which caused injuries to his side. Sounds about right. You get poked with scissors and sometimes you wind up with a hole in you. She faces a charge of aggravated battery in connection with well, that incident. A couple of weeks later, on October 2nd, Luna here texts Derek with an ultimatum. Quote, let's fight to the death. Unquote. She shows up at his house wearing a headlamp and has her coat on backwards. And of course, she has her trusty pair of scissors with her. I'm not opening my front door if the other person on the other side is wearing a headlamp. That's fucking scary. And she goes all Beverly Hills Ninja on him and starts chasing him around with Benny Hill music playing. She knocked him out of his loft, chased him around the kitchen, and managed to poke holes in Derek's head, torso, and neck. Derek's new girlfriend is there at the time. And uh, he moves fast. It's only like a week later. And she runs for cover once shit gets real. And she calls 911. At 11 p.m., the cops show up, and poor Derek is in his underpants, bleeding everywhere, and sitting on top of Luna, subduing her. So he's taken off to the hospital, and he tells him, Well, hey, guess what happened to me? I woke up, and uh, somebody was stabbing me in the head with scissors. Now, he had just filed a restraining order against her that day. So, she didn't like that, and she wasted no time trying to kill him. Derek had broken up with Luna about a week before this incident. Which makes the timing funny, because two weeks earlier was the first time he was stabbed with scissors. And he's only been broken up with her a week. So, he stayed romantically involved with her for a week after the first stabbing. Whatever, either way. She's in custody now and facing charges of attempted murder and aggravated battery and one case of burglary for stealing the new girlfriend's phone. 
Her bond is set at $250,000. And I don't think she has any money because she was reportedly homeless after Derek booted her out. So she's fucked five ways from Friday. And there you have it. Another inept episode of the worst true crime podcast ever, Evil Done Badly, is in the books. If you would like to reach out and suggest future episode topics, we can be reached on Instagram at Evil Done Badly or by email at Evil Done Badly at gmail.com. So thanks for listening. My name is Dick, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks again. Bye bye.